Luo Bing Wang imprisoned, listening to cicadas. To the west of the palace where I am imprisoned, across the wall, is the courtyard of the law section. It has some old scholar trees, like the old trees mentioned by Jing Zhongwen. But the judge here has some sweet crab apple trees, like those of Xiao Po. Every evening, when the light of the setting sun reaches the shade under their branches, the cicadas begin to sing. Their faint song brings sad thoughts to those who hear it. Autumn has come, and the cicadas start calling. A guest here, in my convict's cap, I think even more of home. How can I endure the way these dark cicadas come to sing to this white-haired old man? Because the dew is heavy on their wings, they can't fly close. In strong winds, their sound is easily lost. If no one understands how pure their voices are, who will ever understand what my heart holds? So, here we have uh, another poem uh, by one of the four worthies, four great poets of the early time. As we mentioned when we talked about the previous one by Wang Bo, uh, the four worthies of early Tang were four, four poets from the 7th century that were generally quite appreciated later on. Of those four, only two, Wang Bo and Luo Bing Wan, make it into this anthology and only with one poem each. Now, the reasons why they are so underrepresented or why the other two uh, are not present at all probably have to do with what they mainly wrote. So, uh, the fame of these poets comes, I think, most of all for their prose texts in parallel prose, Pian Wen, and from their Fu poems. Now, the Fu is a genre between prose and poetry, usually translated in the West as rhyme prose, prosimetry, rhapsody, and none of them are included here. So perhaps that's the reason why the other two, Jiang Yong and uh, Lu Zhaoling, haven't been included in this anthology. So Luo Bing Wang, what can we say about him before we start talking about this poem? Luo Bing Wang was a southerner. He came from the southeastern coast, Zhejiang, but lived mostly in the north. He held a series of minor appointments in the central bureaucracy, uh, but he is most characteristic and characterized by his intense loyalty to the Tang dynasty. During Luo Bing Wan's life, uh, the widow of Emperor Gao Zong, um, Wu Zetian, uh, became, well, already when her husband was alive, she was the, the puppet master controlling all uh, the imperial administration. After her husband died, she tried to become an emperor on her own behalf, an unprecedented uh, and uh, non-repeated event in Chinese history. And uh, this is something that the scholar officials with their strong misogynistic slant would revile in later ages, the arrogance, the usurpation of Wu Zetian. Now, Luo Bing Wang was against uh, the empress and he wrote and uh, he conspired against uh, her. For those uh, first elements of conspiracy, he was arrested. And while he was arrested, he wrote the poem that we have here. Later on, he was set free and he participated in a rebellion and probably died in it. So he was taken later on as a paragon of a virtuous and moral writer confronting a, a debauched female ruler. And uh, the poem that we have today is a very representative poem of, of this period. And it's quite, in spite of its apparent simplicity, it's a very dark poem. Like I mentioned before that the four worthies of early Tang were, in their own different ways, each trying to subvert the Kung Tishi, the courtly style poetry of the previous centuries, which was characterized by a very narrow range of subject matter, generally courtly scenes, courtly objects, beautiful women, in uh, luxurious pavilions and so on, they, 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 and this this poetry had a mainly a purely aesthetic and sensual uh, purpose. So uh, these four poem 
poets, among others, tried to reform this poetry, but they did it in different ways. Some of them went for simplicity, others went for even greater obscurity and a, a more serious subject matter in a different widened subject matter. So Luo Bing Wan is, you know, he's being quite dark in this poem. This poem is chock full of, uh, of references to literary figures and literary texts. But, well, it still can be read on two levels, even if you are unaware or unperceptive of most of those quotations, I think you can get the gist of the poem. So very obviously this is a poem about, uh, this is a sad poem, the topic of the, of the poem is unrecognized merit, which is a topic we've encountered in many other poems. The unrecognized merit, the virtue of Luo Bing Wan, who is in jail, is unrecognized and unheard, just as the song of the cicadas who are singing uh, in the garden next to his prison, just as their song is drowned out by the strong winds. So the virtuous, the pure, the unsullied cannot thrive, cannot be recognized in this time of chaos. Yeah. Uh, cicadas are uh, an animal that comes in autumn. Their sad cry is associated in typical Chinese poetry, which correlates uh, the seasons with human feelings. It's generally associated with decline, old age, uh, uh, the beginnings of decadence, sadness. So it's very appropriate that their cry should make the poet think on his own sadness and his misery while he's growing old, unrecognized and in prison. Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, the poem has a prologue, which says as follows. To the west of the palace where I am imprisoned, across the wall is the courtyard of the law section. It has some old scholar trees, like the old trees m mentioned by Jing Zhongwen. But the judge here has some sweet crabapple trees, like those of Chao Po. Every evening, when the light of the setting sun reaches the shade under their branches, the cicadas begin to sing. Their faint song brings sad thoughts to those who hear it. So the, the prologue creates the context for the poem. Uh, this is very appropriate, because remember that Lu Xi are very small synthetic poems, uh, they're only eight lines long, and in this case it's an even shorter one because it's a pentasyllabic mm, lushi. So a prologue helps in really setting the background of, of, of the story so that the poem can focus on feelings and on lyricism. And as, uh, as, as I said before, it condensates in, in very few characters a lot of arcane imagery. So the poet is in prison. He can hear and see perhaps some cicadas in the neighboring garden, and uh, he feels sad when he hears them, and he composes a poem inspired on them. The prologue has two references which uh, I haven't been able to trace, so they're, they're a bit pedantic, but uh, he's talking about trees in, in the garden, so he mentions the, the garden next door has some old scholar trees, I think this is a type of tree which is uh, called also the Chinese scholar's tree, is a tree that has uh, very beautiful hanging and aromatic flowers. And anyway, uh, those, those are the old trees like the ones mentioned by Jing Zhongwen, which was an uh, uh, Eastern Jin politician and writer. Um, I'm not sure if the reference is intended also to point towards a similarity in the lives of Jing Zhongwen and Luo Bingwan, as Jing Zhongwen was a supporter of, uh, was, of different uh, candidates to the imperial office and was executed. Uh, by the last one. I have no idea who Xiao Po is here, but you know, you can see the parallelistic contrast already in the prologue, not only in the poem. So the, uh, the, the old scholar trees of Jing Zhongwen, the sweet crabapple trees of Xiao Po. Anyway, let's go to the bulk of the poem. Uh, I'm not sure the poem can be divided into parts. I don't think most of the, of the Lu Xi profit from division into parts. So let's just go couplet by couplet as usual. Autumn has come and the cicadas start calling. A guest here in my convict cup, I think even more of home. So the first couplet is already parallelistic. As you can see, uh, it's, that is already a parallelistic couplet. So autumn has come. One of the harbingers of autumn is the cicadas singing in the trees. And uh, so they are the, 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 the singers, the bringers of autumn. Yeah? 
And the poet is here. He is in his convict's cap, thinking of home. He's in his convict's cap because uh, he's a prisoner. And he is thinking of home because, you know, the sadness of autumn always reminds people who are far from their places of their original place. Now, this couplet was originally parallelistic in the, in the original version. Instead of autumn, uh, I think the original poem says something like West Course Cicada's Voice Singing. So West Course, the direction of the West, remember the West is associated with autumn in Chinese tradition. As for the cap, uh, the poem would say Southern Cap, long, Longing Home Intruding or something like that. Uh, so it contrasts West Course, Southern Cap. Yeah. So this southern cap refers to an anecdote uh, of the past of, of a man from the state of Chu who was once in the north and uh, he kept wearing a hat from the south, from his homeland to remind himself of, of, of his homeland from which he was exiled. So basically just a couplet saying autumn is coming, I am a prisoner, I am a southern prisoner far from my home and I feel sad. How can I endure the way these dark cicadas come to sing to this white-haired old man? So, feeling sad, feeling worried. The song of the cicadas makes him feel even sadder, even more desolate. And he's an old man, so, so uh, the poignancy of, of suffering, of old age, of autumn, of the passage of time, is even more keenly felt by him. And again, in the original, more than uh, this is this is represented through uh, very dark pedantic images. I, I will read another translation of this poem after I finish this, along with a paraphrase, so that you can get an idea. But for the moment, let's stick just to this poem. So this second couplet, yeah, you know, just presents us the intensified sadness at hearing these cicadas and growing old and being already an old person. Because the dew is heavy on their wings, they can't fly close. In strong winds, their sound is easily lost. So autumn is also associated with dew. Yeah, it's a time when dew comes back and it, it becomes very heavy in the winter, it turns into frost. So this dew stops the cicadas from flying away. They can't come close to the prisoner. And also the strong winds uh, deafen the sound of the cicadas. The cicadas make quite a light sound, quite a high sound, so it must have been a very strong wind, one that would be able to cover them up. But remember, this is symbolic. Yeah? When, when he's talking about the wind that drowns the cicadas, he's really talking about mm, the slanders, calumnies, uh, the corruption of the world, hiding the virtuous uh, song, the virtuous song of the poet or of the insect. Finally, the last uh, couplet, uh, which, you know, wraps up the message. If no one understands how pure these voices are, who will ever understand what my heart holds? So if people are incapable of hearing, of listening, of understanding the cicadas, the, their pure voice, their keen feeling of sadness and of worth, of merit, of purity, how can my little song how can what is contained in my own soul be heard, listened, paid attention to? So, quite a harsh indictment of uh, his time, in, in the line with many Chinese poems with, which complain about the lack of recognition of the scholar official. Now, let me read, this, is, uh, this was the translation in the book I'm reading by Geoffrey Waters. There is another translation that I'd like to read by... Uh, Stephen Owen, who is one of the greatest sinologists alive and a great translator of Tang poetry. So his translation goes as follows. The western course, a cicada's voice singing, a southern cap longing for home intrudes. How can I bear those shadows of black locks that come here to face my song of white hair? Dew heavy on it, can fly no further toward me. The wind strong, its echoes easily lost. No one believes in nobility and purity. On my behalf, who will explain what's in my heart? 
so as you can see, uh, Owen's translation puts the emphasis in those obscure images. I think uh, Geoffrey Waters has chosen to simplify the poem to make it more available as a poem and to Western readers, whereas uh, Dufu has chosen a more scholarly course by including a more literal translation of the images in the original poem, Western course, Southern cap, Black locks, Song of white hair, which uh, Geoffrey, Wa Geoffrey Waters prefers to, you know, paraphrase. Now, because Stephen Owen is aware of the difficulty that understanding his version of the poem implies, he also writes a paraphrase for it. And the paraphrase is as follows, and it's quite a long paraphrase, so see how much information can be, you know, packed up in an apparently so simple poem. When the sun moves through the western course of the heavens, a sign of autumn, the cicada sings. Its singing causes homesickness in me, like that once felt by Chung Ji of Chu, wearing his southern cap as a memento of his homeland when a prisoner in the state of Chin. Like him, I am a southerner, imprisoned in the north. How can I bear that those wings of the cicada, so often used to describe the curls of beautiful ladies, come to listen to my song of white hair, like that which Cho Wen Chung sang when Suma Xiang Yu abandoned her. Those black cicada wings like curls remind me of youth and attract a beauty, unbearable to one who is growing old and feels rejected by his ruler. Furthermore, since the singing of the cicada is a reminder of autumn, the season associated with the coming of old age, how can I bear that it come any closer to me reminding me of my own ageing. But perhaps I have misunderstood the cicada. Associated with purity in old age, it may be a kindred spirit. If my ruler hears it, it may remind him of my purity and old age, and thus obtain my release. In this respect, its singing is like pleading my case to the throne, but it, like me, is caught up in the autumn situation that it represents. The dew is so heavy upon it that it can fly no further, and thus will not be able to get into the palace and reach the ruler's ears. Furthermore, though I might hope that its singing will be heard from outside, the autumn wind is so strong that its voice will be drowned out. Even if his singing, or my own in this poem, were to reach the throne, it would do no good, because no one believes any more in nobility or purity, neither mine, my innocence of crime, nor that of the cicada. Thus there is no one to state my case for me. So, as you see, quite, quite a long paraphrase. And, and the paraphrase does explain all the references, all the quotations that are included in the poem and uh, all the different associations, which the Chinese poem with its five syllables per line and only eight lines, you know, synthesizes to the utmost. And, you know, this is, happens a lot in classical Chinese poetry. It's very, very, very synthetic. It expects a lot from the reader, both a lot in cultural and in historical knowledge and a lot in filling with meaning a vague line which uh, may be unspecific about number, genre, time, and other aspects. After all, remember, this poetry was not created for the people. This was the poetry that scholar officials created for other scholar officials. So, you know, you had to be in the club to really understand it. But uh, still, I think that even without this paraphrase, even without all these notation, I think any reader reading at least uh, the translation in 300 Tang poems in Geoffrey Waters' version can really get, can really grasp the main idea of the poem. The poet is in prison, he is sad, he's growing old, he misses his home, he feels empathy with the poor autumn insect that will soon die, that uh, is singing and nobody is paying attention to it and nobody appreciates its nobility, its purity, just as nobody appreciates the poet's nobility and purity. So I think the message gets through, even if not the small details.